Forget gurus. Forget anyone claiming to be an online business expert without going through the challenges of entrepreneurship themselves. The Real Money, Real Business podcast is here to prove the best insights in online business comes from your fellow online business builders. We dig into stories of entrepreneurs selling their business on the Empire Flippers marketplace so that you can learn how they made their business profitable, how they overcame obstacles, and what lessons they learned in their online journey. If you want to take your business and your knowledge to the next level, you've come to the right podcast. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Money, Real Business podcast. We record these interviews so that potential buyers can learn more about the business and the seller to help them make an informed buying decision. If you would like to learn more about this business, including details like what type of business it is, how much revenue and profit it makes, and all of the assets included with the business, simply visit empireflippers.com forward slash marketplace and search for this business's listing number, which you can find in the video thumbnail and in the description. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can click the link in the description to go straight to the listing. So without further ado, let's get into this interview. First up, let's learn a little bit about you. Can you tell us about your background in building and running online businesses? Hi, guys. And firstly, thank you for taking the time to have a look at our business. You like what you see and that we get the chance to talk to you about it in a bit of detail. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not from America and nor is my business partner. We are, in fact, from New Zealand and we run a business globally from here with operations now in eight countries. As far as experience and background, my business partner happens to be one of New Zealand's leading industrial designers, having worked for groups like Apple, BMW over the years. He uh, holds the distinction of designing the world's best-selling toothbrush. He's still upset about it, having only been paid $1,100 in design fees and not getting a royalty on it. Myself, I've been in retail and marketing all my life. I did my MBA at UCLA in 99. And since then, I've gone on to run some of New Zealand and Australia's largest retail businesses, including several e-commerce businesses and including growing one of the largest e-commerce businesses in the region. We both have extensive business experience. We're both qualified directors at our stage of life, which is late 50s for me and my business partner turned 60 last week, a place we now like to be. Why are you selling the business now instead of keeping it and growing it further? The reasons we'd like to sell our business is actually pretty simple. Firstly, we're very proud of the business we built. It's a great business delivering a great return, and there continues to be wonderful opportunities to grow. However, I'm 57. My business partner turned 60 last week and has always said that he'd like to, let's say, hang the boots up by that stage. And so we've got the business to a point that it is clean. It's easily able to be handed over. There's growth opportunities, as I've said, and simple as that. We're getting on. We'd like to take a bit of money off the table, but we'd also like to make sure that the brand and the business continue to grow globally. Can you describe the amount and the type of work that you do on this business to maintain it? About three years ago, the business was going well. Myself and my business partner put a CFO in place and built a team around it. Us, I have in the last three years largely backed out of the business, director of our company, and will work on the odd project here and there. I also provide regular mentoring for the CEO and uh, team if required. My business partner still does a bit of design work in the business, but he too is largely not involved on a day-to-day operation. We are very happy to continue helping if a sale does go through. So if you were to keep this business, what are some of the ways you were trying to grow it? So to start with, I'll focus on the bottom line rather than just the top line. As you'll see when you get into our business, we manufacture locally, wherever we could easily have gone to China, manufactured the product over there at a significantly lower cost. But we manufacture locally for a couple of reasons. One, we believe people like to buy local. And so in America, we're proudly American made. In Europe, we're proudly European made. In Australia, we're proudly made in Australia. But that means we use small locally owned factories throughout the world. There's an opportunity, of course, to bring all that back into China, centralized manufacturing and cut your manufacturing costs probably by about 60 or 70%. I wouldn't recommend that, 
But what I would recommend and what we're underway doing at the moment and will continue during this sale process is to review our supplier contracts. We think we've been a bit benevolent to our suppliers over the last few years. We've never had a supplier drop us. We've got great relationships with them, but we think there's a little bit of cost in there that we might be able to squeeze out. In addition, the team that run our business, we have invested heavily into people. We think you could run the business on a lot less people and resources than what we have. On a sales line, there's a couple of really interesting opportunities. We're unusually, we're almost an entirely pure play Shopify business. 92, 93% of our business coming through our direct consumer Shopify accounts around the world. We do about 4%, 5% in B2B sales. Now that has largely over the years, I think we have about 500 small accounts around the world. They've largely come to us. We put a person on last year to manage those accounts. And last year and this year, we've started to build out a rep network in America. And we think there's a bit of growth in that channel. But probably the biggest area of growth is in Amazon. We have done virtually no sales in Amazon up until last year. With our product and our brand, we wanted to keep the product away from Amazon for as long as we possibly could to avoid imitation. Last year, we launched slowly during the year and did about a quarter of a million dollars without really trying over the November, December, Christmas period. So when you look at a pure play e-commerce business selling a product like ours, who are only doing two or three percent of their sales of our Amazon, two percent of their sales of our Amazon, there's a lot of opportunity there to grow that channel. Another area that we keep dabbling with because we know there's a prize there is corporate gifting. We just never seem to we put it on the business plan every year and never seem to get around to having a look at it. Probably the easiest channel to grow our business, or the two easiest channels, one The nature of the product that we make is regional. So it's a a simple product, but it's designed regionally in every country we go. With 193 countries around the world, there's a lot more countries to get into. We've got a matrix for how we would decide to launch into new countries that we're happy to share with you. But we think you could easily take our product, or not think, we know you could easily take the product and with a bit of focus and energy, expand it into other countries. The other area of growth would be product diversification. So again, when you see our business, you'll see that there's a very, very narrow line of product that we make a lot of it. And we tell wonderful stories in order to sell a lot of it. But there are hundreds, if not thousands, of other products made out of the same material with the same factories, with the same process that you could expand into. So a quick summary on that. I think there's cost reductions to come out of the business. I think B2B, there's an opportunity there. I think Amazon is a great opportunity expanding into that channel better than we have. Corporate gifting and then regional expansion into new territories and countries and then product diversification using the same materials and product that we work with. Right. And what would you say are the biggest risks with this business that buyers should be aware of? Well, to start with, having 40 years in business, I don't like risk and I've tried to mitigate as much of it as possible, including in our business model. It's It can be run as largely a variable cost business. What you will see is a product that is very quick and easy to manufacture with the systems that we have set up. So if we put the juice down on some advertising and generate a thousand orders today and don't have that product in a warehouse, we can make it within 24, 48 hours and ship it. Those systems are all set up and run through third parties. So they're a variable cost. The good news is though, we collect the cash, you know, when the transaction goes through being an e-commerce business. So it's a relatively a variable cost based business, but there are some risks involved that you will see. The first and most obvious one is when you see the product, you'll go, well, anyone can copy that. And you're right, we've been copied and mimicked and ripped off by thousands of organizations for the best part of a decade. The good news is, is that none of them can tell a story like we do. And none of them have got a brand like we have. Our brand resonates with people. Our customers are incredibly loyal to us. We have, uh, depending on what region, a 20 to 40% returning customer rate. But the product itself can be copied. To that end, we've had multiple court cases around the world 
most of which we win or we settle prior to prior to going to court. We have had court cases, in particular one in Wyoming, where we've had judgments in our favour and settlements and damages in our favour. So we have IP that's protectable. We spend over the, in particular in Q4, over the Christmas period, we do an enormous amount of takedown notices through Etsy, Amazon, Timu, Alibaba, and a lot of people have kind of given up copying us. While it looks like you can copy the product, it's difficult. We're, we, we're, we're quite aggressive on protecting it. And then what no one can copy is the storytelling and brand and heritage that we have set up around the business. The next largest risk that you'll see is around the seasonality. So the company is largely a gifting business and a memorial business where people gift our product on memorial occasions and there's a very strong emotional attachment to the product, but also over, in particular, the Christmas period where our sales and our revenue and profitability are heavily, heavily skewed. There's no easy way around that. The best way around that is to minimize your costs during the year. We haven't done a great job of that. We've had staff that we've carried through during the year. In hindsight, we probably should have probably shuttered the business because we sort of tread water during the year, lose a bit, make a bit. And then at, uh, Q4, October, November, December, uh, really bring it home then. And the third area of risk, but it's more of an industry risk, is around Meta and AI. As it stands, we're very, very heavily reliant on Meta for customer acquisition and email as well. We have a database of just over 800,000, of which just over half of that are engaged. So large database. And as email is increasingly challenging to get through the inbox filters, and as Meta becomes more challenging, those two are industry risks. We think we've got some ways around it and also think there's other ways of extending the product into different advertising channels that we can talk to. How much support are you willing to offer the buyer who acquires this business? With regards to supporting whoever buys our business, when you look into it, you'll see an incredibly strong brand. We care deeply about our brand. We care deeply about our business and we care deeply about making sure it succeeds beyond our ownership. Everything is negotiable, but myself and my business partner have time and we're very happy to help in any way we can in the transition strategy growth of the business on an ongoing basis. We're definitely not cut and run. We want to be there to help and support and see you succeed. Got it. And regarding the sale of the business, would you agree to a non-compete? With regard to the non-compete, We've been making and selling this product for a long period of time. Once we pass the company over to someone else, we have no desire to make any more of it, but we're very happy to help with whoever takes it. We won't be competing in any way, shape or form, and we'll be there to support in succeeding and growing. Are you open to negotiating something like an earnout agreement? With regards to the possibility of an earnout payment structure, of course, everything's negotiable. But we do believe that we've got a great business. We believe there's a lot of opportunity in it. And we also believe it's fairly priced. But everything in life is negotiable. So only too happy to talk. Okay, final question. If you had to put yourself in the shoes of a buyer, why is your business a business worth buying? First and foremost, it's profitable, makes good money, but also has plenty of opportunities, as I've already outlined, to move into new channels, to move into new categories diversify and also to expand a simple model into new regions. There's also plenty of opportunities to save on the bottom line and I think cut some costs out as well. The business model is a great model. It is a largely a variable cost model where orders come in and money is collected prior to paying manufacturers and third party suppliers and advertisers. So it's a great a variable cost model. And that means the risks are are lower on a business like that as well. Some of the other lesser areas outside of money making, it's a sustainable business. We've been very conscious of that. We use recycled packaging. We use VOC-free inks in all our printing work. We manufacture using local manufacturers and distributors in every region we operate in, which hugely reduces our carbon footprint. I'm not sure if you're aware of a standard qualification environmental qualification globally called B Corp. 
but we have passed our B Corp certification and a B Corp pending and have been for a period of time. And B Corp not only looks at the environmental side of the business, but also looks at the social and governance side of the business and how transparent it is and how well it's run. And to that point, the business has been very well run and is very transparent. We've had great governance, regular board meetings, clean and accurate reporting, nothing hidden anywhere. So it's a very easy business, we believe. All the IP is held in a separate entity, and that entity can be transferred along with the IP and the domain names and everything across. So it's an easy transition. We've structured it that way. So when we did come to sell, it would be easy. But also, it's a couple of other things. It's a it's a wonderful global brand. Once you look at it and start talking to people, for a real niche product, you'll be amazed how many people in whether you're America, Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, how many people actually know about the product or have seen it or heard it or have one. So it is a truly a global brand, which we're always amazed at. In New Zealand, we're very good brand managers. And we've New Zealand, there's a design award that is the you know, the creme de la creme of advertising and branding awards. We won, you know, that award three years ago for our brand work every three or four years and even higher honors given out to companies who have the highest level of achievement in branding. In New Zealand, there's only ever been five companies over 20 years achieved that award. And those companies are some of the biggest in New Zealand, like Air New Zealand, our nation's airline. And our company, our little humble business has won that award along with our biggest companies and so you you get a truly wonderful curated brand we have a wonderful brand book and guidelines on how everything works happy to share that to you and I guess the last reason or the last couple of reasons one it's a lot of fun we've had a blast doing it for a long period of time and never fails to amaze me where we end up we have a couple of big projects that we will hopefully tell you about that any buyer will benefit from coming around the corner but it is a lot of fun. People love the product. It's a great story. People get very emotional about the story and about the product. And we literally get hundreds of emails every week talking about the emotional connection to our product and our brand. And then finally, guys, we want to see the brand and the company succeed. And we're happy to help on the journey if you buy it. Hopefully you like it and we look forward to talking to you. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. To learn more and see if this business is still for sale, head over to empireflippers.com forward slash marketplace and search for this business listing number, which you can find in the video thumbnail and description. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, click the link in the description to go straight to the listing. Once you've unlocked this listing, you'll find everything you need to know about this business. So thanks for joining us. See you next time.